Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Trisha Pham, and I am the Promotions and Community Specialist at the Huntington. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion about the Huntington's upcoming stage production of The Bluest Eye, adapted by Lydia R. Diamond from Toni Morrison's landmark novel. As you may know, we originally hoped that this would be an in-person event for the BIPOC community, created in collaboration with the Guild Sanctuary in Dorchester, that it would include a healing ceremony and community dinner, in addition to a conversation about the production. However, because of the rise in COVID numbers, it made the most sense to transform this event into a Zoom conversation. We hope to reschedule an in-person event with the Guild Sanctuary for some time in February or March, and we thank them for their efforts around this event. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the Huntington's physical spaces uh, stand on the occupied homeland of the Massachusetts people, and we recognize the Massachusetts tribe from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth of Massachusetts have taken their name. We'd like to pay respect to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit the land to this day. We honor and respect that many Native peoples who are connected to this land, past, present, and future, including the Nipmuc and Wapanog peoples. All right, and then uh, just doing some technical housekeeping with y'all. Um, our program this evening will be uh, run as a webinar, meaning that those of you in the audience won't be visible to the panelists or one another. However, we'd like to invite you to ask questions through the program using the Q&A function. We also encourage that you, uh, we also encourage you to chat and comment throughout the panel uh, using the chat function. Um, just select uh, to all panelists and attendees in the drop down. We hope this can give us a bit more of a community gathering feeling um, and, uh, you know, just have fun together. Uh, please feel free to ask any technical questions in the chat. Uh, just start your message with uh, tech help. So that's T-E-C-H and H-E-L-P as well. Um, and to anyone who would like to unmute and ask a question verbally, please use the raise hand function so that we can call on you to ask your question out loud at the end. Um, please note that this conversation is being recorded to be posted later on our website and that closed captioning is available. Just uh, click the bu CC button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Great. All right. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to our moderator, Arielle Gray. She's the arts engagement producer for The Artery on WBUR, uh, Boston's local NPR station, where her work focuses on the intersections of marginalized identities using a social justice lens. She will introduce our panelists and serve as our skilled conversational guide. Ariel, thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Trisha. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation tonight. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our three amazing guests um, and to have them on to talk about what went into creating this play and this production. So first we have Awoye Timpo, who is the director of The Bluest Eye at the Huntington. Her work has appeared on stage at theaters in New York and across the country, including New York Theater Workshop, The Public Theater, National Black Theater, Long Wharf, and Berkeley Rep. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, good to see you, Aria. Hi. Next, we have Sandy Alexander, who is the dramaturge for this production. I hope I said that right. <laughs> um, she is an associate professor, professor at MIT, a Toni Morrison scholar, and the author of the book, Properties of Violence, and many other articles. Hi, Sandy. How are you? Hey, Ariel. Hi, everyone Hi. in the audience. And then lastly, we have Aubrey Dubé. Um, who is the sound designer for The Bluest Eye. He is joining us from New Orleans tonight. And he has previously worked on Top Dog, Underdog, The Purist, um, and The Purist at the Huntington. His sound design has appeared in productions at Company One Theater, New Rep, Boston Playwrights Theater, The Umbrella Theater, and many others. Originally from Botswana, he now lives in Boston. Hi, Aubrey. How are you doing? Hello, I'm great, fantastic. I'm excited to be here with you guys and spread love. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you. And we hope that everybody watching from home has questions. Um, obviously, these three people here tonight, um, they know their craft and um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of really important themes um, in this play. And you know, what kind of influence <clears throat> you guys to put this together in the way that it got put together. Um, and I think the first question I have to ask, which is kind of like 
um, almost an obligatory question when we talk about Toni Morrison, is that whether you encountered her in high school or college, or you're just encountering your work, so many people remember when they first, you know, either read her work or encountered her work. Um, and specifically the bluest eye, when was the first time all three of you, you know, first encountered the story? I'll go ahead and kick us off. Um, I can't remember um, exactly how old I was, but I know um, I was in school, I guess probably middle school. Um, so it was the first time that I um, was introduced to the work and I, I, I really knew it. I rem what I remember of it is the story of it. I came to learn about Toni Morrison and the rest of her writing much, much um, later. Um, but it was in it was in probably middle school, maybe early high school. Um, actually, similar to you, Aoi, I feel like for me it was yeah. In, it, I was all the way in Botswana in a primary school, and my um, uh, because that's what we call them there, and my. Uh, teacher of the language of English, she had like, you know, quotes from just different like um, famous people or different authors or different people of influence. And I, I think that's the first time I, in, uh, you know, came across Toni Morrison. I didn't even know anything about like the theater, like the plays or anything like that. It was just sort of like, that was the first time I encountered that name. Uh, thanks for the question, Ariel. It's a great question because there are so many ways to keep re-encountering Toni Morrison. You know, you you meet her in high school via text and then you re-meet her again in college and it's like meeting a new person because you've changed. Uh, so I think the first time uh, that I read Toni Morrison was probably in college. Um, um, and, and, I, and I'm guessing too that the sense was, you know, she was a kind of difficult person to read. So uh, one had to wait till college to get to her. At least my high school felt that way, it seems. Um, it seems like it's different now. The, Toni Morrison is taught in high school, uh, thankfully. But yeah, it was college for sure. Um, I just love always hearing everyone's stories about how they, you know, first encountered her work. I think I was also in high school and had to read The Bluest Eye and I didn't really get it at the time. And I had to reread it once I was older, you know, to really understand. And that kind of leads me into my next question is, you know, what is it about The Bluest Eye specifically now? It's 40 plus years since, you know, it's been published. What is it about the story that, keeps people, specifically people like us, so fascinated with it. Um, yeah. Sandy, I'll, you look contemplative. I don't know. <laughs> Do you want to answer first? That is how I always look. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it about it? Um, oh, man. I, I think... I think a lot of it has to do um, with the shock of the story and how early we get um, we get to the end of the story. Like we know what the end of the story is from the very beginning, right? So I think there's something about that structure then that taps into our curiosity because as readers, we're supposed to read till the end, to get to the end. Like we read for plot, we read for the end, but here's a story where we get the ending. The ending is pretty shocking and we still want to know more. So I, I think that's part of it, right? And that it also centers a little black girl, which feels um, momentous, which feels uh, important, which feels different. Right. Oh, well, you were about to say something. I think I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that sounds like such a great Sandy Alexander question. So that happened exactly the way <laughs> it was intended to. <laughs> um, but no, I, I totally agree with everything Sandy's saying. And, um, you know, there is something I think too about this, as Sandy's pointed out, um, that the story is told through these both 
young girls, but also these old girls, you know, the people who are telling the story. Um, and just the, the curiosity of them, I think, feels can feel very familiar. Um, you know, they're, they're on a journey of discovering their community and discovering themselves. And I think that's such a great kind of vessel to um, invite people into, into a story because it feels familiar to us. We, we can recall and remember, even if the experience is not our exact experience. Mm. Yes, I love that. Um, to add on what um, everybody has said, for me, the, another element that draws me to towards the story is just the fact that the very simple fact that I care about um, black stories, I, I care about black storytelling, I care about you know how um, how we are portrayed in general, you know, and. Um, as, a, as, as you've mentioned, um, Ariel, that, you know, I, I live in Boston. So, you know, as a theater pr practitioner, you know, that's been trained in, in, in that liberal arts think tank. And, you know, I'm sort of like, a, 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 you know, just sort of immersed in this world where I, I, I hone my tools and hone my skills to a lot of the stories that I've been a part of. Um, have not been black stories and you know that's not a knock on Boston University or Middlebury College that where <laughs> I went to but it's just it's just one of the things where I is a situation that I find myself in so it's it was such a refreshing thing to just be able to be involved in a project that I know that it's it, it goes beyond just the themes that I care about it's it goes beyond the the collaborative team that I'm with it's it's also about the truths that like pertain to me and the the skin that I wear every day. And I think the really unique thing about, um, you know, Lydia Diamond's adaptation of the play is that it's really the only one that we really have, you know, that's been so widely produced across the country. Um, and so it is quite a big task to take this momentous, very, very, um, thick, <laughs> I think that's the only word I have sometimes for Morrison's writing, to take this book and transform it for the stage. And I'll start off with you, Awoye. What was part of the task that you had to take on to bring this to life? Um, you know, and also like, what were some of the most important aspects that you wanted to make sure you translated from the book or the story to, to the stage? Mm, that's such a great question. And you know, it's interesting, you know, speaking of the adaptation into a play, there's one other um, Toni Morrison adaptation I've worked on. So Nambi Kelly has done an adaptation of the book Jazz, um, which we worked on a number of years ago. And yes, the eyes, Sandy, uh-huh. Like epic, I'm like, I, I really, I applaud these playwrights because I don't know, like you just have to have such like strength of your own, you know, confidence you have to have to be able to say, how, how can I take these kind of epic stories and 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 transform them into a piece of and transform them into a piece of drama. So um, it's just a huge shout out to both Nambi and Lydia for um, taking on the task so that we can share this work with audiences in a, in a new um, in a new way. And I mean, there's so many things that we wanted to make sure to, to honor um, from the book and also um, from Lydia's um, adaptation. And I think the thing that's coming to first to mind is just this notion of um, time that, that uh, Toni Morrison so beautifully plays with, I think, in, in, a lot of the, in a lot of the writing. How do we tell a story from 1941 that's also a story of today and how do we make sure that when the audience leaves they don't feel like oh that's such a great story from the past you know that they really feel the connective tissues to um to today so i think that's that's the one i think i would begin with it's just this notion of time and that the um, um, you know, the, the kind of circle of time that we, that we live in, like that, that the stories of these, of these characters is very much the story of today, or it lives in, you know, it, it, it continues to reverberate now. Um, yeah. I, I love that, the connective tissue. Ooh, that would give you chills. Um, <laughs> I think one of the ways that you guys accomplish that, though, is um, through the music and the sound, for example. Aubrey, would you mind talking a little bit? Because, you know, I looked at the playlist and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, stuff like period 
music, you know, there's also some Marvin Gaye, but then you also have some modern artists like Kamashi Washington on there, who's absolutely amazing. I love him. Can you talk a little bit about like how important it is to kind of meld both then and now? It is pretty much uh, mirroring exactly what I always just talked about. These are um, themes that uh, were very, very relevant in the 1940s and are still very relevant even more so today. It's just, uh, uh, I was just, when, when I was just talking real quick, just to just sidebar real quick was, I was just thinking about the self love theme that is very, very prevalent now, more so that we've had a lot of time inside our rooms, inside our houses by ourselves, inside in front of like our mirrors. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but, uh, 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 you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, like I, I'm, I'm from a, a large family. I have a, uh, you know, like, you know, lots of sisters and brothers. So part of the things that like would, would be, you know, when people have time and stuff, like I, I, I remember just these visions from like, say for example, my sisters, like, you know, weaving their hair or like one of them sitting, or even as sometimes my brother actually sitting by the mirror, like trying to like pop a pinball. That's like, you know, just, and that, those are like effects of like things of just like having that time to be able to reflect and kind of like, you know, uh, uh, give the time or the, 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 the topic of self-love a lot more time so you know it's a uh, uh it's something that like was obviously like you know it's been there even in the music like from from you know like uh many decades ago to even right now so it's like a lot of i feel like there's so many parallels that that are uh pertinent still and very more so more it feels like they're even more relevant today so um, yeah, so that's why, like, for example, in the in the music playlist that we have, we have just a lot of like, um, you know, uh, uh, what I would, what I would re refer to as like soulful, like you know, lots of music with love, <laughs> and and it's still like you know, still like we still have like some um, uh, 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 in the sound palette for the show, a lot of like music that's still you know trying to you know access what that definition of, of love is today you know um that's that's partially part of like some of the the the, the uh vessels of inspiration that have influenced the the playlist um to come together in the way that it did thank you aubrey and sandy i mean you're these are my words you're like a tony morrison expert um so it's like you know your job on set to I don't know, basically give all of that knowledge that there is about, you know, Morrison and the world that she's building. Like, how do you bring 1941 Lorraine, Ohio to life? Uh, thankfully, Morrison did that. So I didn't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, this book, the novel, um, effectively started in 1941. I mean, she begins writing it in the 1960s. But it started for her in 19, in the 1940s when she was in elementary school and she encounters a little girl who, you know, who aspires to, who wants blue eyes. And she is a kind, I mean, Toni Morrison is appalled by this, um, you know, and if Toni Morrison is in elementary school, this is around 1941, right? So she, I mean, the beginnings of The Bluest Eye is in that moment where she encounters, uh, you know, an elementary school friend who wants blue eyes. Um, and that continues. I mean, that, that question about self-regard is one that continues to be a theme for Toni Morrison throughout her career, right? So it is a question of how one gets to that point of having self-regard um, and it's opposite, you know, self disesteem, like, how does that, how does that happen? Right. Um, and so she takes the 1960s into consideration as well, where folks are affirming black is beautiful. Folks are talking about self-reliance and self-determination and self-regard. And Morrison remembers that encounter in 1941 with her elementary school friend and says, well, I don't know that many people felt that, right? Um, 
you know, how do I how do I continue to tell the tale of those people who possibly fell through the cracks, who were not out there saying, um, you know, I'm black and I'm proud, black is beautiful, um, because a lot of them were not yet there, right? So, uh, you know, to think about those characters and to write about them and to respect the fact that self-regard does not happen in a vacuum, like it is. I mean, there are factors that help to create it in the same way that there are factors that help to create uh, self-disesteem. So that's how the, I mean, that's how the decades come together from when Toni Morrison was 10 to the 1960s to the current day when, you know, self-regard uh, continues to be an important um, topic for, for her. Um. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, I guess the next, I have so many questions and I know we have a limited amount of time. Um, and Sandy, I just want to go back to you really quickly because um, I had watched a talk that you had given at MIT. Um, it was like a webinar sort of thing, I think in response to racism on campus. And you had quoted Morrison, you had opened with Morrison um, about the function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. There will always be one more thing. Um, and that just really got me thinking about the bluest eye and how the play can be really hard to like bear witness to, like we talked about, to see the things that happened to Pecola, this little girl. Um, I just wanted to ask you about that. Like, um, why do you think sometimes there's such a, a vested interest in looking away and like not acknowledging stories like Pecola's? Um, you know, it's an important question, um, especially for a text uh, that has been on the banned list of books for years and years and years. Um, you know, and my sense is that, you know, uh, parents who feel like their children should not be reading this uh, kind of book, this kind of language in school, don't have a clear sense of how much care teachers, playwrights, directors put into teaching this text, right? Um, into bringing it into life for audiences that um, the book requires that kind of, uh, of, of careful tending to in order to teach it to young people even adults, right? Um, and I think it's worth remembering that, you know, the main narrator, I mean, vacillates between being a young girl and being an older, older woman, right? And so, so she has learned something from the shocking incident, from the psychological murder of this young black girl. She has learned something from it, right? So much so that she is able to narrate the story retell the story. And at the end of the story, she's able to say what she has concluded from all of it, right? So it feels like, um, yeah, part of the desire to look away um, has to do with not knowing, uh, I guess, what one can glean from actually looking. You know, uh, folks just forget how powerful observing is. Like, um, you know, as much as taking in can be powerful, consuming a thing can be powerful, and, you know, changing and maybe triggering, looking at is also, uh, uh, has an effect, right? I mean, it's like the observer effect, you know, looking at something will affect it too. Um, so I guess that's what I'd say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And just the metaphor that you just used, obviously the gaze, right? The eye um, that goes into what I wanted to talk about next um, um, with the design of the stage. It looks like an eye and it's a circular, you know, the guests sit in a circle around the stage. Um, can you talk a little bit, um, Oye, about like that intentional set design um, and, you know, kind of that griot storytelling that you've talked about in some of your previous interviews that you want to convey through, through this, um, through this form. 
Oh, I think you're muted. Thank you. Um, it's such a good question. And it, it relates, I think, to um, what, what Sandy's outlining as well. Um, meaning, what, what does it mean? What is, what's the invitation of the text, really, you know, to, to see ourselves, to understand um, what the land is that we're walking upon, and to make sure that we don't um, look away that part of our um, healing as individuals and as a community requires our presence and understanding of where we've come from, and even through the painful parts of it, um, how do we how do we work through that pain in order to come to a kind of a, a larger under understanding? So you know, it's very it's very interesting um, that we are doing this play now. I mean, it's a timeless piece of work, um, but our how, how we've approached the play is different than how we were thinking about the play, you know, three years ago when, you know, we first got the invitation to, to kind of create this piece. Um, and so we've really been thinking about what does it mean for us to gather um, and how do we um, um, capture the spirit of let us let us you know it's very Richard the Third. Let us let us let us sit upon what's the Richard the Third? But now I'm forgetting it. But let let us sit and gather and tell stories. You know, um, it's something so fundamental um, to who we are. And I feel like it's been a really beautiful thing as we've kind of come out of and gone back into different lockdowns. It's like the thing that we yearn is to come together with other people and hear how they're doing and tell stories. Um, so we wanted to create that energy in the space. So we created um, a universe and an environment um, where everybody is sitting in a circle. And then the actors are also part of the community. They're the storytellers of the community and they gather us to tell the story of the bluest eye. Um, so that's kind of the, the, evo the evolution of it, but we're kind of really pulling at something really, I think quite um, ancient. Mm. And just for anybody watching who may not know like what a griot is or like, you know, what that what that is as a lineage, can you just quickly explain that? You know, it's so it's so beautiful and interesting, just the ways um, in black traditions that we, how, how we how we tell stories and how people have been appointed <laughs> as the storytellers of the community. And it's not even just to for the purpose of telling stories, for the purpose of teaching, for the purpose of learning, but also for the purpose of kind of passing down lessons and stories from, from time, of, of generations past to the generations yet to come. Um, and, you know, as we're thinking about um, oral storytelling traditions, this is the way we pass down our lessons, pass down those, pass down those stories. So that was the role and the function of, of the griot. And, you know, we had a session last week um, with a wonderful um, professor at Stanford um, who, who is really engaged also in the notions of storytelling. And it was actually really one of the things that he said that was so beautiful is also, you know, kind of, I think also like the competition of storytelling, you know, who's going to be the best storyteller in, in the community, which is really great, but it's so connects to how we are as Black people now, who, as you're sitting in the barbershop, in the salon with your friends, who, who tells the best story in the best kind of a way, you know? Um, so it's been really beautiful to kind of um, anchor ourselves inside of that um, tradition um, in order to um, create this production. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously a huge part of oral storytelling, you know, a lot of times there's music involved and music is what sets the scene and brings forth the spirits and the ancestors. Aubrey, um, you know, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, the things that you had to take into consideration when um, working on The Bluest Eye. Um, the things that I had to take in con into consideration include a lot about like myself, which is what makes this process so cool for me. <laughs> Cause um, you know, I, I, I really, you know, I'm sort of, uh, uh, I've been dying a lot for a chance to share, uh, you know, of course, Africa is a very big place and, and, and everything, but like the connectivity about how theater, the world of theater exists in Africa is just based on coming together 
sharing, you know, st ter telling a story, competing to be who's the best storyteller, knowing that all those things are community events that are necessary and that are like part of like the, uh, what keeps the fabric of the community together. So I, I really, um, you know, a lot of times when I'm like thinking about this play and my work in it, I, I start by looking inward <laughs> and being like, okay, what can I, you know, cause, because a lot of my work, uh, 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 you know, has been more of like look out what first, and then bring the things, you know, closer to 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 you know all, all the storytelling team that that's around and stuff. So so um, my my with, with that being said, so uh, uh, the crux of my collaborative my creative process is collaboration, and and uh, that has been so so so. Um, prevalent and so, uh, uh, what's the word, no, like, um, uh, it's been a catalyst to my creative process a lot because I've, I've had uh, several meetings with OEA and actually other members too in the sound, in the sound uh, design team. And, and it's been a very much sort of like, oh, you know, we have this, this, for example, let me just refer back to the Spotify playlist. It's a collaborative playlist that like, you know, um, um, you know, it's not like sort of my music taste and my interpretation of the play. It's sort of like coming from different areas too. And that's, that's um, uh, a, a key ingredient in sort of shaping what, what we have in terms of the sound design conversation for the play right now. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I answered your your question um, because I, <laughs> I'm excited about so many things. You can tell. <laughs> I know I can. I can. It's palpable, and you know, um, we're coming up on about four minutes out from the end of our conversation. And talking about excitement, Sandy, I'll bounce back to you. Like, what are you all most excited about? You know, with this play. Um, yeah, what excites you? Like. I'm excited about being in collaboration with others. You know, as a scholar, a lot of the work is very solitary. Um, and it's been so scintillating to just be thinking with people about how they're thinking about Morrison's text, Diamond's text. It's just been, um, it, it feels like it's been booing me up, <laughs> it, it, you know? I feel like I can say so many things about this text. I can write so many things about this text as a consequence of just being in conversation uh, with people who are moved by it, like literally moved by it because they're acting, they're embodying characters. Um, so I'm excited for the collaboration and for how, um, how this text, which is, you know, you read in a, in a room by yourself to prepare for class, you know, how it would, <laughs> how it will come to life and how uh, people that you've just been pretty much vibing with um, will do it justice with their bodies. It's like, what? That's, that's exciting to me, so. Um, oh, wait, yes, please go. Yeah, I feel, you know, um, last week in rehearsal, um, Sandy introduced the word celebrate. Um, and I think that's the thing I'm excited for, and she can speak more to it, but um, it was just the celebration, even through the kind of darkness of the of the story, the fact that we get to celebrate its creation, that we get to celebrate these characters, that we get to celebrate this history, you know, I think so much of... Um, uh, you know, especially the past couple of years, but certainly, you know, lifetimes, we have to contend so much with what's not possible, the things that we have to fight against. And I think I feel very happy to just celebrate possibility, just the possibility of storytelling, the possibility of what is it, what's it going to mean to gather the Boston community? How are people going to be changed? How are people going to be, to borrow another Sandy word, how will they be moved inside of, inside of this um, experience? I feel like, you know, none of us take our responsibility as artists inside of the community lightly. Um, and I feel very happy just to celebrate the possibility of art, celebrate the possibilities of theater, of collaboration. Um, so yeah, it's been a great process so far. 
yeah and and for me i think like it's that um um the congregating aspect of it was sitting going, going to be sitting in a circle and that excites me so much <laughs> uh, i can't begin to say how much because it's it's uh one of those things things where like we are actually acknowledging that we're storytelling and we're gonna be also asking I, I feels like the the configuration also asks for the a certain level of engagement from the audience that's you know different from the from the norm so I I'm excited to see how that um uh how how that 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 response like sort of pans out because I I uh, I wanted to say one of my uh the the quotation that lies in my uh, uh, classroom in primary school, if I vaguely remember it, it's something along the lines of we, we live in the world uh, when we live in the world. Uh, oh my God, I'm going to butcher it. Something like <laughs> together in the world. Something that, it's about togetherness. It's about together. I'll tell you, I'll tell you that I, 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 I love that, that quotation so much because, um, um, you know, it's a, uh, in 30 seconds, I'll, I'll summarize this, this quick little story that, uh, so my mom uh, pretty much in Botswana, when I was growing up in Botswana every day, as an African mother, you, the sun does not find you in your bed. When, it, when the sun wait, well, you know when the sun <laughs> rises you know so so whether even if there are no chores you have to find a chore so 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 some of the chores would include like gardening and like making sure that the the you know for the the the, the plants are watered etc cetera, etc cetera. and sometimes would find that there would really be no that much stuff to do and that much gardening to do in in the house so would end up my mom would end up finding uh, <laughs> By making my brother and I go clear the neighbor's yard because that <laughs> neighbor didn't take care of the yard because you know and then you know later would hate that so much my brother and I would hate that so much but then later on we kind of you know I I, I understood that like it's about knowing that like if your neighbor's yard is dirty your yard is is you can clean it a hundred times your yard is dirty too <laughs> you know there's gonna be a pest infestation some rats are gonna grow there and then they're gonna come into your yard and then all your efforts are like few. so 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 Tony that Tony Morrison quote is about like connectivity and that's saying your achievements are my achievements your problems are my problems you you we are the same you know so I I I'm excited for that sort of like uh, for sharing that sort of message and that story and that's in, in, in with that sort of con configuration. So, yeah, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. Thank you so much, Aubrey, for um, closing us out on that last question. And now I want to open it up to any questions from the audience. Um, you can drop your question in the Q&A um, down at the bottom or raise your hand and um, I think we'll be able to see you and, you know, and hear your questions. So I'm going to give it a minute or two for anybody to ask questions. I always feel like a teacher, like <laughs> no questions, no questions from anybody. And okay. Oh wait, there, here's one question. Oh, you talked about difficult themes. Would it be appropriate to bring a young child? And I think that's probably a question that is asked a lot about The Bluest Eye in general, like as a book. Um, I'm not sure, what are you guys thinking? That's a wonderful question. Um, my instinct is to say yes. But I would like to, um, it might be a question for Trisha <laughs> or a member of the Huntington staff, um, because I'm sure um, on the website, they will have something on there that says, you know, we have crafted um, a kind of a statement that says, these are the themes that are addressed over the course of the production so that people can make an informed decision, both as adults and young people, um, you know, if they are, um, um, want to experience and engage with those themes over the course of the over the course of the production. So I would say mm -hmm. there's probably an age advisory um, that the Huntington is, is advising on the website. Um, but I mean, certainly the 
storytelling aspect of of the um, of the play is very um, relatable and there's nothing, um, some of the language might be a little bit more explicit, but there's nothing physically explicit that we, that we show on stage. Um, but I will toss that to people who know much better to me about that. Um, mm -mm -mm. I feel like I'm getting a note here. From I think Rosalind said um, eighth grade and up is recommended by education department. And I think Trisha was going to come on. Sorry, I think I may have cut you no off. No worries. No, I, I, I concur with that. It's, uh, it's honestly at the discretion of, um, you know, as, for, as parents, <laughs> for parents to uh, decide upon that. But it's also um, such a universal story. And I feel like um, it's, 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 it's always like needed to be told. So, so that's honestly up to the discretion of you as the parent, but I personally, as a former teacher would say uh, middle school and up, but honestly, if, if you feel like your, uh, your child is mature enough and, um, you know, willing to learn the material, then come on out, have a family night out and uh, come see this wonderful production. Um, and yeah, I think again, if you have any doubt, um, Oswaldo, you know, you can go onto the website and check out that advisory that they've put together. Uh, the next question we have is from Adrian, and they asked, what was the hardest aspect of the book to translate to the stage? Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, it's it's truly actually a question for, for Lydia, because there are so, I mean, there's so many events, there's so many circumstances, there's so um, many characters. Um, so, and going and going through and seeing, I can only imagine what the experience was for her to say, you know, she must have had to say, what's the story that I really want to tell? Um, what's the centerpiece of this story? And what are the most important ingredients in order to articulate that? Um, but there's a lot of stuff that naturally, you know, it's a 90 minute um, production. Um, there's a lot of stuff that she inevitably had to pull out, but I suspect um, that she centered on what's the most important theme, what are the most important themes, and what's the thing I want people to leave with at the end, and what are the events that I need to highlight in order to achieve that. Um, so, but again, it's just, it's an extraordinary task, and she truly rose to the occasion. It's a beautiful adaptation. Thank you. Um, those are all of the questions that we've gotten so far. I do wanna ask one question. Um, if you guys have one or a character that you um, maybe not necessarily like the most, but connect with the most um, in the story. Sandy. Um. You know, I wish I had Claudia's gumption when I was her age. Um, I didn't have it. And I think, why didn't I have it? Um, I was just an obedient child. I liked to read. Um, I was a good student. So my rebellion came later, you know? Uh, I just wish I had that, that, that self-confidence earlier. Uh, right. I eventually got it. I mean, I eventually got it, I think. <laughs> but she had it young. She had it young. I remember um, the scene where she tore apart the, the white baby doll <laughs> to get to the middle. Um, and that scene just like blew my head away. I was like, what a great metaphor for this, for this young girl. I think I'd have to say it's probably um, like a combination between Claudia and Picola, but kind of at different stages of life in a way, you know, um, because I can totally appreciate, um, you know, America is such a toxic place. I mean, the ways that the, the images that we were fed as a child, and you know, I certainly grew up 
before the internet, before this current moment that we're in, very much kind of just at the tail end of the Black is Beautiful movement. But, you know, the images that we grew up with and what you understand as beautiful when you're a child, like, um, it's, it's, it, can, it's, it can be so, destru it can be so destructive, you know? Um, so I can absolutely empathize with that experience of, of Picola. And then at the same time, um, and, you know, it's funny thinking about these young girls, but they're also older women and that kind of evolution that we experience of them. Do you know what I mean? And what it means to kind of then um, learn the language of empowerment and to be able to experience that as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's it's such a it's such a journey. I think that's just the beautiful thing about the characters. They you see where they begin and you see where they end. Um, and I feel like I, I, I can really um, um, empathize with that journey. Yeah, um, for me, I'm more like Sandy. I feel like, you know, as I was last born child and as I mentioned, you know, I'd be dragged by my mother saying, oh, let's go, you're going with your brother. To, and I'd just be like, okay, you know, and, uh, you know, if I could have channeled my inner Claudia, then, you know, then <laughs> I might have had a better childhood, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, I, 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 I draw a lot of inspiration. For Oop, sorry. That's my dog, by the way. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got two sleeping right here. It's a miracle they haven't barked yet. Oh my God, <laughs> it's so annoying. Um, thank you so much, Aubrey, for your answer. Um, this isn't a question, but Patricia says, um, I like this event so I can enjoy the play more. Um, I definitely think that hopefully this conversation helped to add for folks who didn't have the extra context to really come into this play and, and take away something meaningful. Um, okay, and one more question. Can you all talk a little bit about the cast and the kinds of conversations you all are having in the rehearsal room? I can kick that one off. Um, yeah, we have just the most amazing, gracious, generous, talented, fun, open, <laughs> loving group of people um, work, working on this. They're just, um, and I don't, I think maybe a couple of them knew each other prior, but um, they just have, they just have really beautiful um, energy and they're just, um, they're just a very open, curious, kind of voracious group of people. So it's just been such a wonderful um, exploration. You know, we've had, so as Sandy was mentioning, just really incredible um conversations um I don't know everybody is so kind um so it's been it's been really beautiful even though you know we've had some people on in the rehearsal room some people on zoom you know for the first week but somehow we've been able to kind of have a kind of collective creation and energy so it's been it's been really beautiful I'll just add, like, say from a designer standpoint, I was fortunate enough to be in the uh, rehearsal room in person the other day, and uh, it was, the energy was just remarkable. It was just so palpable. It, it, there's a family uh, vibe that is so strong, and part of this this play is obviously, you know, the, there's the, the girl story, but there's a lot about family that, like, I feel like, <laughs> has just sort of like you know just morphed and grown into um, um, everybody that's sort of like hands on with this play whether on stage or off stage and and those vibes I just um, I feel them you know and um, yeah that that's 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 all I'll add to that. Andy, do you have anything that you want to add before? Uh, I just remember one session where the. I think the, the 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 buzzword or keyword was responsibility, and it just felt it was palpable um, that the cast feels, you know, certain responsibility to do justice by these characters, right? Um, but also to uh, do justice by uh, Lydia Diamond's uh, work, and um, there's lots of responsibility. There's a lot of history there too, uh, so. Mm -hmm. They're carrying it and they're carrying it really honorably. So kudos. Uh, thank you all so much. 
Um, I think just really quickly, I'll say out loud, there were a couple of questions asked and answered in the chat, um, just for everybody else. Somebody asked if the play will stream online. The answer is there will be a digital streaming version that will be released a few weeks after the start of in-person performances for anybody who's wondering. Um, and I think this is probably a question for um, Trisha or, sorry, another, <laughs> another person. Um, do you think that Omicron will impact production start at the end of the month? And will the theater have any requirements of audience participants? Of, of audience participants. I think most of this is on the website, um, but if somebody from the staff wants to quickly answer that. I can answer that, yes. Yeah. So we will have updated information on our website for, um, um, you know, the uh, status of uh, COVID checks and uh, et cetera, vaccination checks. Um, currently, we are following very closely um, with the CDC guidelines. And of course, uh, we do have, um, contact with the mayor's council uh, on the um, parameters and mandates in the city. So we are following it by the book, if not a little bit more rigorous, um, but you will find all the current uh, COVID policies and information on our website. Uh, and you will actually, uh, in our checkout, um, when you go to checkout for tickets on our website, it actually has like all of it listed before you check out. So you're actually able to read everything before you purchase tickets. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and yeah, I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight um, to talk about Toni Morrison and the bluest eye in this beautiful production that I absolutely cannot wait to see. Thank you, Sandy, Aubrey, and Aoye for all of your insight and just amazing things that you have to say. I have so much to think about. Thank you so much. Ariel, before uh, uh, I know that this is being recorded, so before my teacher, butchers me <laughs> about the quote that I misremembered. The quotation from Toni Morrison was, we live in the world, dot, 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 the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> you pretty much had it though. <laughs> you pretty much had it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you. And yeah, I think that concludes our session tonight. Um, I do also wanna add really quickly with a very popular Toni Morrison quote, but it's one that never fails to touch me. Um, and it's, if you want to fly, you got to give up the thing that weighs you down. Um, and I think it's actually the S word, but I won't <laughs> say it online. Um, but yes, I will end on that note as we start this new year out. Thank you everybody for joining us. All right, everyone. So that concludes our panel for this evening. And I just want to uh, point out in the chat, Edith, uh, that is amazing that you enjoyed the book. We can't wait to have you in um, our theater with us. And we do have student discounts. So uh, do keep that in mind when you're sharing that with your peers. Um, great, awesome. And so uh, I just want to thank our panelists, Awoye, Aubrey, and Sandy, and of course our moderator, Ariel Gray. And to you guys, the audience, for this lively discussion, um, just please be on the lookout in your inbox for more information about the performances of The Bluest Eye, which will start on January 28th at the Calderwood Pavilion in the South End. And you can always visit HuntingtonTheater.org for tickets and more information. All right, everyone, stay safe. Thanks for coming out, and we hope to see you in person soon. Good night. <laughs>